come to draw with me. Home of the, of the moose. Many, many, many mooses appeared all across social media in the last week, thanks to our exercise last week of drawing mooses, watercoloring mooses. So many varieties, but all so well done, so nice, so interesting. So thanks for moosing with me. As you can see, if you've ever watched that draw with me before, um, I'm in a different place and I'll be here on and off for the next month. We decided to flee the steaming cauldron that is Phoenix, Arizona to go to an undisclosed location that is much cooler up in the mountains, surrounded by not mooses, but we have seen an enormous amount of elks, which are kind of like sort of mini mooses, I guess, somewhere between a deer and, an, and, a, and a moose. Um, and they're very kind of unafraid of, at least of me. So um, that has been an interesting kind of thing, considering that we just spent all this time drawing mooses to have elks all around us. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, and in some ways, changing locations and also changing all of my apparatus because I didn't have my whole studio set up that I have usually have um, in some ways reminded me of two years ago two and a half years ago when the pandemic began and we were doing draw with me at that point almost every day and we were doing it from my sister and brother-in-law's um, backyard in a lot of cases in Phoenix when we first were um, escaping from the pandemic or inadvertently escaping from the pandemic. You probably know the story by now. But um, strangely, my brother and sister-in-law are here in the cabin with us again. So we've really come full circle, jerry-rigging together bits of camera equipment and having them around too. So that's all very nice and uh, much more pleasant than when we were under the stresses of the beginning of the pandemic. So um, yes, Barbara, I see that you are, you are experiencing COVID right now, or at least your husband is. Barbara is, has told us that she and her husband are on a cruise and he's been diagnosed with, with or is tested positive, I guess, for COVID. And now they are sequestered in, in, a, in a ship. It seems a bit scary. Um, I mean, being on a cruise ship can be scary anyway. Don't get me wrong. So anyway. Ah, okay, um, I'm just looking at through all of the wonderful comments. And so today, as you may have seen from the little announcement about about uh, today's episode, that we're going to be tackling the Mona Lisa. And it's something we did a long time ago in Draw With Me, maybe three years ago. But I felt like doing it again. And um, that may seem very intimidating to you. And here it is, the Mona Lisa, the most probably the most famous piece of art there is, right? Um, but I'm going to try and make it less intimidating. And certainly when you see how I draw it, that should take away any anxiety you have around it. But, but basically, it's going to be, we're going to do our own interpretation of the Mona Lisa. How do we see it? What do we, how can we make it our own? I want to show you a few examples of that. So here, of course, is the original by Leonardo da Vinci. It's been in the Louvre for, I think, almost 300 years. But he painted it just over 500 years ago. I think it's 1503. Um, so yeah, so there it is. That's the original. Now there's also this one. Have you ever seen this? So this is in the Prada, I think, in, uh, in Spain. And this is if at one point they thought, is this a knockoff? Is it a forgery? But no, this is actually another version that was done in Da Vinci's studio at the, at the time. So he presumably oversaw it in some ways. And uh, it's interesting. It's in much better shape than, than the original. But it has a very different kind of vibe to it. Even though it has a lot of the same content it is different looking. So very similar and yet clearly different. And there's an interesting thing. I don't know if you'll notice this, but one of the things to me that was always distinctive about the Mona Lisa is she doesn't have eyebrows or eyelashes. 
but apparently they've done analysis of the painting and this one is more accurate because she actually did have eyebrows and even eyelashes but they apparently wore off I think this painting has been dragged around and bumped around quite a lot the original and um, so yeah so there's that I'll talk a bit a bit more about its history um, as we start to draw it and there's this version which is by Raphael so you can see Raphael I mean it's certainly when you look at it, it, it makes you think of the Mona Lisa, and yet look at how many different things he did with it, how he changed the background, how he changed so many things about her expression um, and even her pose. But he made it his own, and yet you look at it and say, oh, that's the Mona Lisa in some ways, or it reminds me of the Mona Lisa. Or how about this by Botero? I love Botero. He loves making plump characters and here's his plump version of the Mona Lisa and she has a, she has a sort of a knowing smile but a different kind of knowing smile than the original um, and then this is Basquiat's version I'd never seen Basquiat's version until I did a little bit of research for today's episode but um, he's changed it and he's also combined it with a dollar bill and in a lot of ways, the Mona Lisa is, we, I think we think of its value a lot of times when we look at it. It's, hard, it's really hard to see the Mona Lisa without all of its baggage. If you've been to the museum where it's housed, the Louvre, you've probably seen the Mona Lisa in its glass box where it has been uh, protected for a long time. Mona Potato. I, that's some great comments about the slightly poor kimono and then of course there's this one Rick Myrowitz did this for National Lampoon I remember this when I was a teenager maybe you do too great expression and that's the monkey Mona Gorilla so hopefully this has given you a sense of how we can make this our own we can make her ours um, and make an original piece of art without having to feel necessarily intimidated by all that she represents. In the end, it's a portrait of a woman standing or sitting in front of a landscape. Now, you might say to yourself, I can't draw portraits, I can't draw landscapes. Well, we're going to figure that out. So let's get on it. Are you with me? OK, so I'm going to be working on my iPad today. Every time I draw on the iPad, there's invariably some, there's two things that always come up. One, what application are you using? And I'm using Procreate because Procreate is really, the own, to me, the only reasonable thing to use on the iPad. And secondly, there are invariably going to be people who say, I wish you wouldn't use the iPad. I don't like it when you draw on the iPad. And to that I answer, tough. I like drawing on the iPad, and I, I rarely do it here, but it is fun. I'll try, for those of you who are interested in drawing on the iPad, I'll try and explain a little bit about what I'm doing. Technically, I'm not going to get overly carried away by it, because really, in the end, this is just about drawing. So let's just focus on that. Sorry, I'm making all these caveats. I'll stop now. Um, so yeah, so let's try tackling her. How are we going to look at her? Um, I'm going to move quickly because I want to just kind of catch impression of her. You know, I don't want to get too worried about, um, you know, the stuff. I want to just capture her. She has kind of a fatter face than that, but um, I'm going to kind of go with whatever lines I made in the first place and See, can I can I maintain some kind of Mona? Will you know that I was trying to do something related to the Mona Lisa when you look at it? You know, we'll see. You might say, what the hell is that? But I think the Mona Lisa is so iconic, so recognizable, that anything that even vaguely refers to it is fairly clearly it. Like, you kind of know that that's what the artist intended. So um, 
I think we can have a fair amount of latitude, really, to make it our own, to make to take liberties. And so I'm going to play around. She so the Mona Lisa there's a lot of mysteries around the Mona Lisa, you know, people don't aren't entirely sure even who it's a painting of and its history itself is kind of mysterious. Da Vinci, whoever he painted it for, and this, there's theories about who that was, but whoever he was painting it for, he um, kept it himself. He kept it and he worked on it for a really long time. I think he continued to paint it for five or six years, maybe? Same painting. So that adds to its mystery. It's something that he clearly cared about, put a lot of effort into. And, uh, you know, you could wonder why. What was it that was so special about it to him? There's a lot of interesting things about it. I mean, obviously her, the way that she's looking at us, the viewer, is pretty powerful, pretty unique. We are taken in by her expression, and it's enigmatic. That's sort of usually the term that's used to describe her is enigmatic, and that makes it actually really difficult to capture her expression, but don't feel like you have to. Give her whatever expression you feel comfortable with, you know? Like mine is looking a bit more dour. Um, but that's okay. It it's almost, almost feels more like a, like a selfie in some ways. And then we've also got to deal with her background and to decide how we're going to do that. What are we going to do with that background? Because it's a really interesting sort of fantasy landscape. Um, it is also kind of a bird's eye view which is unusual considering that obviously it was long before the age of drones and um, you know airplanes and even tall buildings really so how did he come up with this kind of perspective it's another interesting thing about it and how are we going to tackle that you know I mean we could And what does this landscape even mean? Was it just like he just felt like drawing a kind of fantasy landscape? Did he just feel like filling it in somehow? What is the significance of it? There's also a lot of mysteries around Da Vinci, so people tend to kind of come up with all kinds of theories about, about him and what he was up to. And again, you can make this landscape into your own landscape. You could draw the view out your own window if you wanted to. You don't have to feel compelled to draw this strange landscape that he drew. Um, one of the nice things about the iPad is I can get rid of her if I wanted to. And I could continue that landscape. But what's interesting about this landscape is it doesn't really match up. If you look at the landscape on the left and the landscape on the right, they don't really sync up. It's like something's going on mysteriously behind her head. But, like, where is that lake and why is that horizon line different? So, you know, interesting. Obviously, those are choices that da Vinci made, but we don't know why. Um, he was, he spent a lot of time, as we said, on this piece, so he presumably knew what he was doing. It wasn't just random. Um... So the Mona Lisa, you know, it's been in the Louvre for a really long time. 
And it's always been known as a painting, obviously. It's been known as one of the great masters, masterworks of, of art. But it is also something that... Um, that is, that's changed over time. So the Mona Lisa was stolen in the 1920s. A lot of people thought that they, that there was some big conspiracy behind it. At one point they thought that Picasso was the thief. And um, he, and I forget who else it was. Was it Apollinaire, the, the poet? They were all accused, dragged into police headquarters and questioned about it. I'm not sure why Picasso would have become an art thief. Um, but that was the one thought. And it turned out that so the Mona Lisa was gone for two years. It was it had disappeared, and that was obviously a fairly big deal. Um, and that is kind of how it became really as famous as it ultimately is because it was just a big news story for a long time and that is how everybody sort of started to think of it as the ultimate painting so that was really only a hundred years ago that that happened so it went from being like yeah pretty famous painting to okay, the greatest painting ever, or the most famous painting ever, most famous image ever. And um, also, the most valuable painting ever. It was, they um, tried to insure it at one point. I think in the last 50 years or so, they tried to insure it, and so they evaluated it. And I think in today's dollars, it's worth close to a billion dollars. They ended up deciding not to insure it, but instead they um, just put more security around it. But still, if you think about it, what would you do? Like this, this hapless person who stole it in the 1920s, who, by the way, it turned out was, um, was just a guard. Somebody who worked in the museum was responsible for stealing it. And... Uh, what do you do with it, Mona Lisa, if you've stolen it? It's not like you can go and sell it to anybody. There's also been stories about like what happened to it when it was stolen and the fact that uh, a theory that the Mona Lisa that hangs in the Louvre today is actually a copy that was made during that time. Again, I'm not sure if that's... There isn't much credence to that, but... So anyway, you can see, like, I'm really, I'm making it pretty loose. I'm making it kind of recognizably mine, I guess, at least recognizable to me. And hopefully you're having the same kind of experience. It's just, in the end, just an image of a woman in front of a landscape. It doesn't have to be intimidating to you. And you can do it loosely. You could make it out of collage. You could do um, a cartoon version of it. You could do it, a manga version of it. You could do so many different things with her to just make her your own version. Decide yourself what would make something your art. Right, something to think about. What, what is your art in all this? What is your color scheme that you usually use, or that you think represents your worldview? You know, because that's part of what we're really trying to do with art. Is again, we're not trying to create perfect copies. There's no point in trying to make a perfect copy of the Mona Lisa. And in fact, we look at look upon copies of the Mona Lisa. With, a little bit of hesitation, you know. Is it, is that really a great thing? No. I think the ones that are more interesting are not the perfect copies. They are the ones that feel like a different artist made them. And 
So all those forgers who have tried to do it, you know, it's ultimately a kind of a pointless exercise because because there's only one Mona Lisa made by Da Vinci, but there could be many other versions made by you or other artists. And so. And I think that that's true kind of of all the art that we make, right? There's no point in comparing other people's versions. Make your own and leave it at that and judge it based only on how close is it to your vision of the world, which is unique. That's all we're really trying to accomplish is to get those images and thoughts and perceptions out of our heads and um, share them with the world in some way. Far more interesting than duplicating somebody else's vision of the world. Because clearly the Mona Lisa meant something to Leonardo da Vinci. It may have meant something emotional, or it may have just been an interesting technical challenge for him and that's what he was at, trying to do. We don't really know. But it doesn't really matter, because we can have our own sort of assumptions about him and what we think he was up to. But we can come to those conclusions ourselves by looking at his art. That's, that's really the purpose of his art, is to show us how he felt about the world. He didn't need it to write it down. We didn't need another expert to do it. I'm just trying different things now to see how I want to kind of vary this. And one thing I was thinking is having something some kind of more yellowy overlay on it. Do I feel like that helps in some way? Not wild about that color, but I can vary it somewhat. So I'm personally not that interested in that background landscape. Maybe you're more interested in it than I am. So I'll focus on it a bit, but not that much. Yes, people are asking about the application I'm using. As I said earlier, it's procreating. And I think having used a number of different applications with the iPad, I feel like this is by far the most powerful, flexible one. It's surprisingly inexpensive. It's one of those things that they really could have charged a lot more for it than they did. But thank you for keeping it affordable for artists. Um, what else can we say about the Mona Lisa? Have you ever seen it? I've seen it a couple of times. And I have to say, my experience of seeing it was not great. I didn't love seeing it. And that's in part because it's just such a scene to go and see the Mona Lisa. You know, and you kind of feel like you have to. You have to see it at some point, but it's just throngs and throngs of people and that becomes what the experience is. So rather than it being about the actual painting, it ends up being about the herd, the herd that is gathered in front of it. And also all the uh, things that people have to say about it, most of which, frankly, I don't really want to hear. Maybe you don't hear what I have to say about it either. Understandable. Um, you know, it's, it's something you'd like to have a, a pure experience of, but 
it's so difficult to to do that with famous art is often like that where it's really you just you, just, you want to see it in person you want to experience it up close and have that full experience and yet the whole scene around it the famousness of it makes it really challenging to have a pure personal experience and so you know we struggle with that and you think well I should just look at a reproduction maybe then So what is it about her smile? It's a, it's a kind of image that sometimes when you look at it straight on, it's, it's different than if you look at it kind of at an angle. If you look at it at a th more of the periphery of your eyes, sometimes that feels like it changes how she looks at you. You know, she's sort of one of those typical like eyes that follow you around the room kind of thing, like in uh, movies about haunted mansions. That's another sort of thing, right? Bird Garden asks, does this exercise go to keeping a digital sketchbook? Um, you know, I think that that's certainly something one could do. I've certainly drawn in my iPad a lot, but I just don't... It's not the same for me, keeping my... Um, I, like, I like an analog sketchbook, I, but I also like drawing on the iPad. It's just a different... I think it plays a different role in my, in my kind of expression, in my career my art life is drawing on the iPad. It's really fun. I, f I find it more playful in a lot of ways than drawing on paper. I like, I like the fact that you have so many tools at your disposal and um, you can just play around so much with all of it. You can pull out all kinds of different colors and different effects. You can spend a lot of time. You can get really overly caught up in that too, where you suddenly are just tweaking and twiddling and deleting and overlaying and you can kind of lose sense of what you were doing in the first place. And it can start to feel more like a, a video game or programming and code or something like that than drawing. You know, So decide if that's what you want or how far you want to go with that particular aspect of it. I made a lot of videos about my experience of drawing with the iPad. Um, and a lot of what I was talking about was how I feel about digital art in general, how that's changed, because I think the digital tools have changed. You know, I think Da Vinci would have loved the iPad, though. That makes, makes you shudder, but I think it's true. He loved, of course, gizmos, invented a lot of them, and uh, he was always an experimenter, and I think he would have said, that is, that is a super cool. How do you like that? My uh, Renaissance Italian impression. Not many people do uh, impressions of the Vinci these days, but I think it's a lost art. I think Da Vinci was supposedly quite handsome. I don't know what kind of a voice he had, though. But speaking of, of tools like this, you know, I think... Um, the fact that David Hockney was such an early and enthusiastic adopter of the iPad 
kind of gives you a bit of a clue also as to how somebody like Da Vinci might have re responded to it. making this up, but I think I heard that Da Vinci had red hair. Did I make that up? Maybe somebody else has heard, has heard that same thing. I mean, Van Gogh kind of had red hair, so maybe that's a thing. In fact, I've seen uh, Arlene's talking about looking at it, seeing the Mona Lisa in real, in person, and that's a huge thing, um, and uh, staring at it with an idiotic grin. Um, yeah, I've seen this. I've seen there's a photographer who did a lot of photos of people looking at the Mona Lisa. And a lot of them do have idiotic grins in their faces. So maybe that is a, a familiar effect that it has. Um, that wasn't my response. Because in some ways it's so familiar, you know. So you, and you, and so you have all the obvious reactions, like oh, it's smaller than I thought, or oh, why is it behind that orange box, or oh, why are there like seven hundred teenagers taking selfies of themselves right in front of it? You know, it's it's kind of hard to get past that and to have a new experience. That was my experience of it. I I felt like all my experiences were like fairly pat. So, you know, that was me. But this idea of making it your own, mine, like why is mine much thinner? Why is your face thinner? It's because I drew it really quickly. I drew that first outline really quickly and uh, kind of stuck with it. That's okay. I don't mind that she's thinner. Terry's Mona Lisa is also an original, it's as it should be. What, what else would we want to do with this? I feel pretty good about that. I feel kind of, kind of complete. There's something about this that isn't quite right, though. So you see, one of the things that I like about drawing on the iPad, and again, I don't want to just keep going on about the iPad, but one of the things I like about drawing about the iPad is the ability to layer, which is something that I really like in painting. I like doing that in watercolor, and. Um, Certainly you can do that with other media. You can do it with colored pencils. But you, just, you can just keep building it up, building it up, building it up. And I think that that is what takes some of the uh, kind of digital curse off it, is it starts to feel a bit more organic because it is layered, layered and layered and layered. And that makes it less, feel less flat. Digital art can feel flat. And that's, a, that's actually an effect that I sometimes like. I sometimes really like the fact that it can look like a color cartoon. Another thing to bear in mind about Da Vinci, and I think one of the reasons that this painting is as is as great as it is, is that Da Vinci. So many of Da Vinci's paintings don't really have lines in them. You know, he really was able to capture everything in terms of just 
layers of planes of color that didn't require outlining at all. So it really feels less like a drawing and more like almost like a photograph in some ways. You've probably seen like people have take have created things that look vaguely like photographs of the Mona Lisa. Like it's kind of kitsch, I think, but it's interesting. This thing about the eyebrows, though, that really, when I read that, I was really struck by it because I thought that's so much of what we think of as this sort of Da Vinci look is the these this these brows but without anything on them and to find out that in fact that wasn't how he did it was, was surprising It's like photograph. Have you ever seen a photograph of of uh, Van Gogh? Google it, and you'll see there there are known photographs of him. And when you look at them, it's surprising because we're so used to his self portraits and thinking about them as the way he looks. But then when you see when you see what he really looked like, it's 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 just interesting. It's just kind of startling. All right, I'm pretty good with that. What do you guys think? Anything else I need to do to it? See, so you're still talking about Procreate. <sighs> so, um, is there a free app similar to Procreate? No, pay $10. It's enough with free. I know you. I know we. None of us have enough money but you've got to support people who make incredible tools for artists and for ten dollars or ten pounds or ten euros whatever it is it's very very minimal and you will support these guys so they'll make better tools for us if we're always wanting stuff to be free you know is that really the world we want to be in where everything has to be where people don't get paid for their work anyway i'm sorry about that but yes just get procreate honestly it's the price of you know couple of colored pencils. It's a really great, great product. And uh, I strongly recommend it. And you don't need an Apple pencil to, to draw with it. You could use your finger. It is only available, though, in iOS. There is not a version of it that works in uh, Android. But there, I'm, sh I'm sure there's something else. But I think that most artists just are more likely to use Apple products, perhaps. Maybe that's the reason they did it that way. I don't know. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little on a high horse about this. But it's true, don't you think? I mean, I think artists in general have always struggled to make a living. And nowadays, there's just so much expectation that content is going to be free. And artists need to support each other, even if the larger world isn't going to do it. And that means being willing to spend some money. You know? Like, when was the last time you bought a piece of art? When was the last time you tried? I mean, I. I, I the thing that I really think is great is when um, artists offer the opportunity for people to pay whatever they want to pay for their art. You know, pay what you think it's worth or pay what you'd like to pay. And um, sometimes you're surprised. 
sometimes you don't expect people to pay quite as much as they do pay for your art and you and you are it gives you a feeling that that you underestimated yourself which is again something that artists struggle with we struggle with what we're worth and uh, you know it's nice when the world reminds us that hey you're pretty good we like you we want you to keep doing what you're doing so we're going to support you in doing it don't you agree or do you just want to have stuff for free all the time I don't know I didn't mean to single anybody out Can you use Procreate on just an iPhone? You can. There's a thing called Pocket Procreate, which you can totally use on an iPhone. Um, yeah, so Bird Garden. I'm sorry. It seems like I was piling on you. I really wasn't. Um, Uh-oh. Did I offend her or him then? Yeah. I think I just want to say... Let's support each other, whatever way we have. Um, good. There we go. In fact, I'm going to turn this off, this light. So it seems to be making a reflection here. There we go. All right, so there's my Mona Lisa. Men have named you. What about that song? Should I put a gold frame around it now? It's already in a glass box. hadn't even I hadn't even thought about that. Just like the the one in the Louvre, it's in a glass bro box. You know that glass box. People have have um, have thrown stuff at the Mona Lisa, but she's in that bulletproof box. Hey, you want to see something cool? Let's see if this works. Check it out. See? <laughs> there it is. This is my whole process. It's kind of weird to watch, isn't it? It's like the ghost ghost version. Making it up, making it, layering it. Kind of cool. 22 seconds, and it took me 22 minutes, maybe, maybe longer. So, there you have it. Um, Melissa says it is her mystery that makes her so fascinating. It's true. There are a lot of mysterious things about her, and so we are, we have the opportunity to kind of fill in the story ourselves and say what is she really about. Does mine have that same mystery? Have I succeeded in, in conveying that mystery that I feel about her? I can't say I did what I did today intentionally, you know, I think, um, I think I didn't have any real plans on how she would turn out, but I kind of like how she turned out, so, there you go. <sighs> um, I think we're done. There she is. Whoops. There she is. There she is. Let's make it really tiny. All right. That's the Mona Lisa. I'm looking forward to seeing yours. Um, what do you think about this room I'm in? Wooden shells? Quite nice. A lot of these DVDs here. I haven't watched any of them. Something about being here in nature. I don't know if I can. Can I turn this around and show you? I'll show you the view out the window. Let me see if this works. Oops. That's the, that's the roof. This is upside down. 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 That's the view right outside this window. 
looking out into the mountains. Quite different, right? Lots of critters out here. Um, maybe next time I'll try and do it outside. We'll see. See if it's if it's sufficiently quiet. It could be nice to do draw with me outside. And we're done. Oops, let me get the microphone back here. Sorry. Um, we are done with today's Mona Lisa. I want to see your Mona Lisas. So if you share your Mona Lisa on social media, could be on Facebook, could be on Instagram, wherever you choose. If you share it and then you put this hashtag SBS draw with me on it, then we'll find it. Imagine next week when we have this whole parade of Mona Lisas reflecting you and your way of seeing her. I think that'll be so cool. I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope that you will remember to include yours. So upload it however you drew it. I really want to see it. And uh, everybody else does too. So even if you're not that happy with it, don't worry about it. It'll still be an interesting experience to share it with the rest of the rest of us. So please do. Um, yes, dannysessays.com. I write this weekly essay on Fridays, tomorrow. And if you sign up for it, it's free. I do it because I enjoy doing it. Um, and it's just about the art process, the creative process, how we see the world, what gets in our way, how to encourage ourselves to be more creative, all these kinds of things. Any of you who've read it, maybe you can say in the comments what you think it's about my essays, but um, I write them every week. And if you sign up for it, you also get this book. Never feel guilty about making art. A lot of people do feel guilty about making art. They feel guilty about taking the time. They feel guilty about spending money. They feel guilty about lots of things around art. And I investigated that and talk a bit about why that is and why you may or may not want to feel that way. And there are other essays in this little book too. And that comes free. If you sign up for a subscription to the essays, which are free, you get the book, which is free. So free, free, free. And then finally, um, Valerie signed up but didn't get any yet. Well, it depends when you signed up. They go out on Friday. So hopefully, if you had a problem with your subscription, write to us and we will figure it out. And we want to make sure that you get it. Um, and also subscribe to this channel. So the way this channel works is we do Draw With Me every Thursday. Um, I've been doing a lot of interviews and profiles of sketchbook artists. And those are generally going up, I think, on Friday, is it? Either Friday or Monday. I can't remember right now. And then I also do a video essay. So it's a, not an, a written essay, but a video essay. I do those once a week, too. If you, if you subscribe, then I can let you know when there are new ones up going up. Another thing also that I've been doing is there's a little kind of blog that's attached to our YouTube channel. And that's where I generally post... Uh, the reference pictures that we use. So, if you don't want, if you want to download it or you want to print it out, you can just go and look there on our channel. There's a thing called community. If you look there, you'll see um, that piece. And if you subscribe, you'll also be reminded about it. So, it's a, I think subscribing. I love to subscribe to YouTube channels that I think are cool, and I subscribe to a lot of them. It just makes it easier to find out what's going on, see the new stuff, and uh, I see some people. Um, Samantha likes the profiles. Yes, we've done some really nice ones. And there are lots of ones coming up in the future, too, including the return of the podcast at some point, probably after I leave the forest and come back to civilization, we will probably start to fire up the podcast again, too. So lots of stuff. And thanks for joining me. Um, thanks for joining me every week. I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.